don't know if some of you remember in the, in the 1960s, the mullet industry was alarmed that young people didn't find mullet terribly attractive. Uh, so they decided for a brief moment to rename mullet Lisa, the Portuguese name for mullet, and that didn't work out very well, so we still call mullet mullet. But Go, Going back here, by the way, in the, 19, in the 1940s, I found an article, 1945, that the, the fastest growing business in Florida, for someone with ambition, that you can get into the smoke fish business for about $50. A couple barrels, uh, a couple dozen mullet, some uh, buttonwood, and in fact, there's a whole great debate on whether the proper wood is buttonwood or oak, and the right spices there. But this is uh, the last fishmonger of Ybor City. I knew him very well, Buster Agliano, a bull gator, by the way, University of Florida, 1950, holding a red snapper there. Imagine writing your brother-in-law, bad fishing day, but uh, we'll show you the catch anyway. Uh, sadly, probably not an ounce of that was consumed. Uh, th this, is, this is interesting here. Um, I've looked at seafood menus and, and uh, restaurants going out. What, what you don't see there, really, are any of the fish that would be on most menus today. You don't see grouper. Grouper is now one of the most expensive fish. You can pay $16. Grouper was unheard of on, in seafood markets, really, in many places before the 1960s. It's only when red snapper becomes overfished, redfish becomes overfished, and, and grouper becomes uh, the, the, uh, really attractive because it, it works on a seafood sandwich, on a fish sandwich there. Uh, pompano uh, was also quite expensive this time, but. Note the uh, shrimp, 20 cents a pound in 1936. Okay, here's, here's where I want it. I didn't realize that was so far back. Professor Deegan mentioned this. This is an interesting, uh, they, they use this image a lot in American history textbooks and also for advanced placement exams. They, they'll show this to students. They say, analyze this. And it's interesting. Do you see anything wrong with this, by the way? Now, again, we don't know... Uh, the best guess is that Le Moyne may have, when he returned to France, said, I remember Indian women sowing corn. And, and he, he that, that's one interpretation of it. But what's wrong with the, uh, the image? If this is 1564 Tamuqua Indians planting corn. First, they didn't plant in rows. Those are European rows. And I think you'll agree uh, they, they seem to be wearing Spanish moss, but those look like women out of Donatello's Primavera. Not, uh, the, you can see the European Renaissance uh, uh, influence on that. But nonetheless, it's in interesting. And uh, let, me, let me give... I'm going to talk about this in just a second. Uh, the most momentous event in the history of modern Florida, I would argue, you can make an argument that the history of the modern world occurred sometime around 1513, and we don't know much about the details, uh, whether it was a Spanish friar, a soldier, or a sailor stepping ashore, might have been Cape Canaveral, might have been, uh, uh, it's somewhere along the Florida coast, and encountering probably ice or Tamuqua or Tequesta Indians. And, and we don't know any of the details of what happened. It might have been a violent exchange, Toledo Steel or Cape Coral, Cape Tip Spears. It, it, it might have been uh, the two exchanging body odors, the smell, or it might have been, I'd like to think, the exchange of foods. Uh, perhaps the Spaniards offering them a cocido, a, a, a Spanish stew, or a soup, or the Indians, a, a, a corn porridge. Uh, but uh, that, be, that event was what the historian Alfred Crosby called in his 1972 classic work, The Columbian Exchange. And, and that, that is, I think, one of the, the great lessons we can talk about in 1513. It wasn't a discovery. 
People were already living here. If it was a discovery, it was mutual discovery. Two peoples, two civilizations getting to know one another. Uh, and, but the greatest consequence of 1513, uh, one of the greatest consequences is the exchange of plants and animals, but also microbes and germs. It led to wide-scale devastation, but also the modern world diet we have today. And it's interesting, the, the, one of the buzzwords today is globalization. And every, the, the assumption, well, globalization began sometime in the 1980s with internet and cell phones. But uh, arguably, one of the first big bangs of globalization began in the 16th century. Uh, this is the a world's colliding, but also exchanging and learning at this time. Taking a measure of the Tumuco Indians at the mouth of the St. John's in 1564, uh, Jacques Lemoyne noted, there is a time of the year when the natives feast with each other. For this purpose, they choose special cooks. The French artist observations reverberate across the century. The place where the cooking is done swarms with activity. When Europeans encountered American Indians, Food both defined and divided societies and civilizations. To the Calusa and Appalachie, the Spanish fondness for salted pork, weevil-infested bread, and rotting cabbage was as revolting as it was revealing. Food defines. To Spaniards, conquerors of Moors, Protestants, and heathens, the food they carried heightened their sense of moral superiority. The fact that Indian women performed agricultural work, that natives did not plant crops in orderly European rows, only reinforced the notions of conquered and conquest. Uh, has anyone here had the opportunity to read the new book by Charles Mann, 15, uh, 15 or uh, 1493? It's really a kind of a modern revision of the Columbian Exchange, uh, uh, a popular book. He writes, the Columbian Exchange is the reason there are tomatoes in Italy, oranges in Florida, chocolates in Switzerland, and chili peppers in Thailand. And uh, one of my favorite quotes, uh, you all know the, the, the movie True Grit, the, the author of that book, Charles Portis, in another book, has a character who's munching on a, on a uh, tortilla. And he, he, uh, he observes, quote, corn, potatoes, tomatoes, yams, chocolate, vanilla, all these wonder th wonderful things the Indians have given us, whereas we Europeans have been here for 500 years and have yet to domesticate a single food from wild stock. Interesting character. And of course, when, when Ponce arrived uh, well, on his uh, second voyage in, in 1521 to the west coast of Florida, it's interesting what they carried aboard ship. They were outfitted, uh, the Spanish historian Oviedo notes that they were outfitted with 200 men and 50 horses, and as a colonizer, quote, he took mares and heifers and swine and sheep and goats and all kinds of domestic animals useful in the service of mankind and he was supplied with all kinds of seed. And this is really the beginning of modern Florida. The introduction of new crops and plants foreshadowed Florida's future as a winter fruit and vegetable uh, center. Sugarcane, oranges, lemons, lettuce, turnips, greens, melons, yams, peppers, rice, and okra helped create a new diet. In Appalachia or Tumukwa Rip Van Winkle would have been startled to witness the changes on the land had he returned 50, 100 years later in, in 1600, 1650. Uh, horses, cows, burros, pigs, sheep, goats, chicken, ducks, geese, swans, rats, even earthworms accompanied the invaders. And the invasive animals were also changing the ecology of Florida. In such a new environments, not all species survive. Sheep died by the flock. Others triumphed supremely. In a root hog or die setting, the omnivorous razorback 
devoured weeds, grasses, nuts, birds, eggs, shellfish, and fruit. Offspring of the famed Iberico hogs, the black pigs had accompanied Narvaez and DeSoto and provided later settlers an almost unlimited amount of fresh meat. Menorcan reds and Andalusia blues, along with white-faced black Spanish chickens dubbed the fowls of Seville, became familiar sights in St. Augustine backyards. Spanish brush and scrub goats survived the voyage and became a source for milk and meat. In the Spanish hinterlands, La Tierra de Bravos Toros, Castilians bred an especially tough breed of cattle. Ponce brought the first cattle to Charlotte Harbor in 1521. And by 1737, a Spanish engineer noted, the country seems to be well stocked with horned cattle and wild horses. And you think of the all-American meal of a, of a grilled steak and a baked potato, uh, a, perf a perfect example of the Colombian exchange. And Spaniards, as well as Indians, Africans, Italians, and Greeks, adapted to Indian corn, snap beans, squash, pumpkins, and sassafras, old world crops such as Valencia oranges, Canary Island sugarcane, okra, bananas, rice, and watermelon thrived in the new setting. Let's put this another way. To understand what all this meant, contemplate the following, that not until the 16th century and sometimes 17th century had any Italian ever eaten pizza con pomodori, pizza with, uh, with tomatoes. Uh, no Irishman had ever peeled a potato. No Hungarian had ever added paprika to goulash. Moreover, there could be no such dishes as Javanese peanut sauce, fiery Bengalese curry, or St. Augustine's chicken purlu with datil peppers. The Odyssey of the Dotto Pepper is an interesting one. Uh, twisting paths, uh, food traveling to and from Florida. For centuries, the Dotto Pepper offered a splendid example of how immigrants bring their foodways and folkways to America. The idea is you, you bring in your suitcase clippings and, and cuttings and, and new crops. And the, the conventional message was that uh, cruelly indentured in British New Smyrna in the 1770s, a group of Menorcans rested their freedom and made their way to St. Augustine. There they survived and thrived. Their lives and diets were enriched by the golden daddle pepper, which tradition insisted was brought from the Balearic Islands. Whether the fiery pepper was smuggled to the Balearic Islands, arrived aboard ships containing cargoes of Mandingo slaves, or brought to Florida by Cuban messenger fishermen, along with incense and sacraments, we simply have not found the missing link. It's an interesting story. Race, rank, and fortune determine how and what one ate in La Florida. Uh, writes Amy Bushnell, an Hidalgo's table was set with Mexican majolica rather than wale pottery and seashells. Instead of a soldier's diet of salted meat, fish, and corn gruel, the Hidalgo dined on wheat and bread, pork and chicken raised on shellfish. Determined to impose a Nueva España on La Florida, Spain faced serious environmental, cultural, and social obstacles. Avoiding starvation was paramount, and feeding the garrisons, missions, and civilians proved daunting. Replicating a Spanish diet founded upon wheat, olive oil, and wine proved impossible. Florida's hot and humid climate mostly doomed the cultivation of grape, grape vineyards and olive trees. 